relax, and use headphones. Cleopatra, her name echoes through history, conjuring images of Egypt's golden sands, powerful rulers, and ancient mysteries. She was the last pharaoh of Egypt, a queen who reigned over one of the world's oldest civilizations. Born into a kingdom of temples, pyramids, and ancient deities, Cleopatra's story unfolds at a time when Egypt's independence was under threat. But Cleopatra was an Egyptian by blood. She was part of the Ptolemaic dynasty, a line of rulers descended from one of Alexander the Great's generals. Her ancestors had come from Greece, taking power in Egypt after Alexander's conquests. For nearly 300 years, the Ptolemies ruled as foreign monarchs, balancing Greek customs with Egyptian traditions. Cleopatra was born into this unique world, shaped by both Greek and Egyptian influences. Unlike her predecessors, she embraced the culture around her. She learned the Egyptian language, something rare for the Greek rulers before her. She studied Egypt's religion, its gods, its history. To her people, she wasn't just a queen, she was pharaoh. This was a time of struggle and ambition, a period when Rome was rising and looking to expand its power. Cleopatra ruled Egypt as the Romans looked east, determined to bring the ancient kingdom under their control. But Cleopatra was clever. She was a diplomat, a strategist. She used every tool she had to protect Egypt and maintain its place in the world. Her story is unique. She wasn't just a queen, she was a symbol, a figure caught between worlds. And in her rise and fall, Cleopatra's life became a lasting legend. Not only of a ruler, but of a kingdom's final chapter before it fell to the might of Rome. So, who was Cleopatra? Let's go back to the beginning. The story of Cleopatra's dynasty begins centuries before her birth, with the fall of an empire and the rise of another. It all started with Alexander the Great, a man who conquered lands from Greece to Egypt and beyond. After his death in 323 BCE, his empire was divided among his generals, each taking control of different regions. Egypt fell to Ptolemy, one of Alexander's closest companions and a skilled leader. This marked the beginning of the Ptolemaic dynasty, a line of Greek rulers who would reign over Egypt for nearly 300 years. Ptolemy became Ptolemy the first Soter, meaning savior. He established Alexandria as the dynasty's capital, naming the city after Alexander himself. Alexandria quickly became a center of knowledge and culture, famous for its great library and towering lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But while the city flourished, the dynasty faced challenges that would define its rule. The Ptolemies were foreigners in Egypt ruling over a people with traditions stretching back thousands of years. Egypt had a unique identity, filled with gods, rituals, and customs that the Ptolemies couldn't ignore. To secure their power, they adopted Egyptian symbols and titles. They called themselves pharaohs, wore traditional crowns, and even portrayed themselves in Egyptian art. But the people still saw them as outsiders, each generation of the Ptolemies faced the difficult task of blending Greek and Egyptian cultures. The court spoke Greek, and the dynasty clung to its Macedonian roots. This created a divide 
with the Ptolemies seen as both part of Egypt and apart from it. Internal power struggles only added to the dynasty's troubles, as family members often turned against one another for the throne. Assassinations and betrayals became all too common as each ruler struggled to hold on to their fragile power. Into this world of conflict and ambition, Cleopatra was born around 69 BCE. She came into a dynasty weakened by generations of infighting and challenged by the growing power of Rome to the west. Her father, Ptolemy XII, ruled in a time of constant turmoil. Known as Auli Tees, or the Flute Player, he struggled to keep control of his throne, relying heavily on Rome's support to secure his rule. But this support came at a price, and Auli Tees faced opposition from within Egypt. Cleopatra, from a young age, witnessed these struggles and the political games that defined her family. Cleopatra stood out among her siblings. She was intelligent, observant, and curious about the world beyond palace walls. Unlike her family, who saw Egypt mostly through Greek eyes, Cleopatra wanted to understand the people she would one day rule. She studied Egyptian, a language her family rarely bothered to learn, and became fluent. She studied the religion, absorbing the beliefs and customs of the land. In her people's eyes, Cleopatra wasn't just a foreign ruler, she was a pharaoh who embraced Egypt's soul. Her education was vast and thorough. She learned Greek philosophy, mathematics, science, and diplomacy. Alexandria, as the intellectual heart of the ancient world, provided her access to scholars and books from across the known world. She studied astronomy, learning about the stars and their movements, skills that rulers used to guide their reign. She explored philosophy, gaining wisdom from the great thinkers of Greece. She was fluent in several languages, including Greek, Egyptian, and possibly others like Hebrew and Aramaic. This multilingual ability would become one of her greatest strengths, allowing her to communicate directly with leaders from foreign lands. Cleopatra grew up with a deep sense of purpose and a sharp political mind. She understood the challenges that lay ahead, not just within her own family, but from the outside world, where Rome's power was spreading quickly. By the time she was a young woman, she was already preparing to step into Egypt's turbulent political landscape, fully aware that her intelligence and skill would be her greatest weapons. As Cleopatra approached adulthood, the stage was set. She was part of a dynasty that ruled both Egypt and itself with equal difficulty. The Ptolemaic line was filled with intrigue, conflict, and ambition, and Cleopatra would be no different. But unlike those who came before her, she would navigate these challenges with a unique blend of Egyptian and Greek identity. And when her moment came, she would prove herself to be one of the most remarkable rulers in history. Eventually, the growing discontent in Egypt boiled over. In 58 BCE, a revolt forced Alites into exile. The people of Alexandria, Egypt's capital, rejected him as their king, angered by his Roman alliances and the heavy taxes he imposed to fund them. Ptolemy fled to Rome, hoping to regain his throne with Roman help. While in Rome, he gathered support among powerful Roman politicians, offering bribes and promises to anyone who could help restore him. In time, Rome sent military aid and in 55 BCE, with Roman backing, Alites returned to Egypt, reclaiming his throne. But the price for this was high. Egypt now owed a debt to Rome that would haunt the kingdom for years. Cleopatra, just a young girl at the time, watched as her father navigated the fragile balance between Rome and Egypt. 
she learned how powerful alliances could make or break a ruler. But she also saw the dangers of relying too heavily on foreign powers. These early experiences shaped her understanding of the complex political landscape she would soon inherit. When Oletes died in 51 BCE, Cleopatra was around 18 years old. According to Egyptian custom, she was to rule alongside her younger brother, Ptolemy XIII, who was only 10 years old at the time. They were to be co-rulers, as was the tradition in the Ptolemaic dynasty. However, the reality was far from equal. Cleopatra was older, more experienced, and determined to assert her authority. She was not willing to be a silent partner in this arrangement. But as a young woman in a male-dominated court, Cleopatra faced immediate resistance. The court advisors, who held significant power and influence, sought to control the young king. They saw Cleopatra as a threat to their control and worked to sideline her. Among these advisors was Pothinus, the ambitious chief minister who held the true power behind the throne. Pothinus and his allies viewed Cleopatra's independence and intelligence with suspicion. They wanted a compliant ruler, someone they could manipulate, and Cleopatra did not fit that role. Despite these obstacles, Cleopatra took bold steps to secure her authority. She acted as the sole ruler, placing her image on official coins, a significant act in ancient Egypt. By issuing coins with her likeness, she sent a clear message to her people. Cleopatra was the face of Egypt's power. She also used her knowledge of Egyptian language and customs to strengthen her claim, something her Greek predecessors had rarely done. To the people of Egypt, she was not just a Greek queen, but a true pharaoh who respected and understood their heritage. But Cleopatra's growing influence alarmed her brother's advisors, especially Pothinus. Tensions rose as Ptolemy's supporters plotted to remove her from power. The court quickly became a battleground, with factions forming around each ruler. In a swift and decisive move, Pothinus and his allies forced Cleopatra out of Alexandria. Stripped of her position and power, Cleopatra was exiled from her own kingdom. Yet Cleopatra did not give up. She retreated to the eastern borders of Egypt, gathering allies and planning her return. She knew that regaining the throne would require strategy, patience, and the right opportunity. Cleopatra was willing to wait for that moment, ready to strike when the time was right. And that moment came soon. Far to the west, a great conflict had erupted between two of Rome's most powerful figures, Julius Caesar and Pompey the Great. This civil war would change the fate of Rome and Egypt forever. Once allies, Julius Caesar and Pompey the Great were now locked in a brutal struggle for control of Rome. Their battle stretched across the empire, drawing in soldiers, resources, and allies from every corner of Roman territory. Pompey, outnumbered and on the run, eventually made his way to Egypt. He sought refuge, hoping that Egypt's wealth and resources could help him rebuild his forces. But Ptolemy XIII and his advisors saw Pompey's arrival as a dangerous liability. Egypt was still heavily indebted to Rome, and backing the losing side in the civil war could prove disastrous. They feared that sheltering Pompey might anger Caesar, who seemed likely to win. In a shocking move, Ptolemy's advisors made a decision they hoped would secure Caesar's favor. As Pompey stepped ashore, they betrayed him. Egyptian soldiers assassinated him right there on the sands of Egypt, a brutal end for one of Rome's greatest generals. They believed this act would please Caesar, showing him that Egypt was loyal to Rome's new rising power. 
But when Julius Caesar arrived in Alexandria shortly afterward, he was not pleased. Instead of gratitude, he felt disgust. Pompey had been a Roman consul and Caesar's son-in-law. He was outraged by the disrespect shown to a Roman of such high rank. Yet, Caesar was now in Egypt, and his presence brought an opportunity that Cleopatra could not ignore. Hearing of Caesar's arrival, Cleopatra saw her chance. She knew that Ptolemy and his advisors would attempt to control the narrative, persuading Caesar to support their rule. If she was to reclaim her throne, Cleopatra needed to meet Caesar face to face. But Alexandria was no longer safe for her. Ptolemy's forces were everywhere, and entering the city openly would have been too dangerous. So Cleopatra devised a daring plan. Under the cover of night, she had herself smuggled into Alexandria. Some accounts say she was hidden in a large sack or rolled in a carpet, carried secretly to Caesar's quarters. When the guards unrolled her, Cleopatra emerged before the Roman general, capturing his attention immediately. Here she was, young, determined, and ready to reclaim her kingdom. Her boldness left a lasting impression on Caesar. Cleopatra pleaded her case, explaining the treachery of Ptolemy's advisors and her rightful claim to the throne. Caesar, intrigued by her intelligence and ambition, agreed to help. But this decision would not come without a cost. By supporting Cleopatra, Caesar effectively plunged himself into Egypt's internal struggle. As news spread of Caesar's support for Cleopatra, Ptolemy XIII and his forces mobilized. Alexandria erupted into chaos as rival armies prepared for battle. Caesar and Cleopatra found themselves at the center of a fierce conflict each side determined to secure Egypt's future. Cleopatra had taken a tremendous risk, but it had paid off. With Caesar by her side, she was ready to face her brother's forces. She had returned to Alexandria not as a defeated queen, but as a determined ruler ready to fight for her throne. Pothinus saw Caesar's support for Cleopatra as a direct threat to their power. They refused to back down, and soon Alexandria became a battleground. Caesar took up residence in the royal palace alongside Cleopatra, setting up his defenses against Ptolemy's forces. The city, once peaceful, was now gripped by civil war. The fighting intensified, and Caesar found himself besieged within the palace. Ptolemy's troops surrounded the area, cutting off supplies and attempting to force Caesar into surrender. But Caesar was no stranger to war. He and his soldiers held their ground, determined to resist until reinforcements arrived. For months, Alexandria remained under siege, with the fate of Egypt hanging in the balance. Finally, Roman reinforcements arrived, tipping the scales in Caesar's favor. With his forces strengthened, Caesar launched an attack, breaking through Ptolemy's lines. The fighting was fierce, with battles raging across the city. In the chaos, Pothinus was killed. Ptolemy, realizing that defeat was inevitable, tried to flee. But as he attempted to cross the Nile, he drowned in the river, a tragic end for the young king who had once held all of Egypt's power. With Ptolemy's death, the civil war came to an end. Caesar emerged victorious, and Cleopatra's position was secure. To maintain stability, Caesar arranged for Cleopatra to co-rule with her younger brother, Ptolemy XIV, a boy of around 12. This arrangement satisfied Egyptian custom, which required a male co-ruler but everyone knew who truly held the power. Cleopatra was now the undisputed queen of Egypt. As Cleopatra regained her throne, her alliance with Caesar deepened. He spent months in Egypt, and together they sailed up the Nile, 
exploring the wonders of Cleopatra's kingdom. This journey allowed Caesar to see Egypt's grandeur firsthand. The temples, the palaces, the vast wealth that Cleopatra ruled. For Cleopatra, this time with Caesar strengthened her position. With the most powerful man in Rome by her side, her rule was secure. During this time, Cleopatra gave birth to a son whom she named Ptolemy Caesar, though he was also known as Caesarian or Little Caesar. To Cleopatra, Caesarian was not just her son. He was a symbol of her bond with Caesar, a potential heir to both Egypt and Rome. The birth of Caesarian had profound political implications. In Cleopatra's eyes, Caesarian's lineage made him the legitimate heir to her kingdom, and, potentially, to Rome itself. But while Cleopatra saw Caesarian as a unifying figure, his birth also stirred controversy. Rome was a republic, and Caesar's connection to Cleopatra and her son raised fears among the Roman elite. Some worried that Caesar intended to establish a dynasty, with Caesarian as his heir. In Egypt, however, Caesarian's birth strengthened Cleopatra's rule. To her people, he was a symbol of continuity and the future of the Ptolemaic line. By the time Caesar left Egypt, Cleopatra's position was stronger than ever. She was back on her throne, ruling alongside her younger brother under Caesar's guidance. With Caesarian by her side, Cleopatra's vision for Egypt's future seemed secure. But as Caesar returned to Rome, political tensions followed him. Cleopatra knew that her alliance with Caesar was only part of the battle to secure Egypt's place in the world. Cleopatra turned her attention to strengthening Egypt from within. Years of political turmoil had left the kingdom weakened. To maintain Egypt's independence, Cleopatra knew she needed a strong and stable economy. She began by focusing on agriculture, the backbone of Egypt's wealth. The Nile River, with its annual floods, nourished Egypt's farmland, and Cleopatra took steps to maximize this precious resource. She organized improvements in irrigation and encouraged the production of crops like wheat and barley, which were traded with other nations. Cleopatra also paid close attention to Egypt's financial affairs. She introduced policies to improve the economy, stabilizing Egypt's currency, and managing resources more efficiently. By promoting trade with neighboring regions, she brought wealth into Egypt, securing the funds needed to strengthen her kingdom. Cleopatra's economic reforms gave her people a sense of security and helped ensure that Egypt could stand strong against outside forces. But Cleopatra's influence went beyond economics. She also understood the importance of her public image. To the Egyptian people, Cleopatra presented herself not only as their queen, but as the living embodiment of the goddess Isis, one of Egypt's most revered deities. This was a powerful connection. Isis was the goddess of motherhood, healing, and protection, qualities that resonated deeply with Cleopatra's subjects. By associating herself with Isis, Cleopatra earned the loyalty of her people, who saw her as a divine protector of Egypt. Cleopatra adopted traditional Egyptian dress and symbols, making public appearances in the attire of a pharaoh. She spoke the Egyptian language fluently and performed religious ceremonies, further solidifying her role as a pharaoh who respected and upheld Egypt's ancient traditions. To her people, Cleopatra wasn't just a Greek queen, she was a ruler who truly belonged to Egypt. But Cleopatra's ambitions extended beyond her kingdom. In 46 BCE, she made the daring decision to journey to Rome, accompanied by Caesarian. She traveled in style, bringing with her a retinue of attendants and treasures 
that showcased Egypt's wealth and sophistication. In Rome, Cleopatra hoped to strengthen her alliance with Caesar and establish a place for her son in Rome's political landscape. Her arrival caused a sensation. Here was a foreign queen, intelligent, powerful, and undeniably captivating, whose relationship with Caesar had already stirred gossip. While in Rome, Cleopatra observed the politics of Caesar's world firsthand. She saw how Rome's senators, generals, and officials navigated power. She studied their customs, their alliances, and their rivalries. Cleopatra understood that Rome was no ordinary ally. It was a rapidly expanding empire with ambitions that stretched far beyond its borders. She knew that Egypt's future would depend on maintaining a delicate balance with Rome's leaders. Caesar, for his part, treated Cleopatra with honor. He even dedicated a golden statue of her in the Temple of Venus Genetrix, a public symbol of her importance in his life. But this recognition also sparked controversy. Many in Rome saw Cleopatra as a threat. She was a foreign queen with close ties to their leader, and her presence fueled rumors that Caesar might establish a monarchy with Cleopatra and Caesarian by his side. Rome's citizens, proud of their republic, grew uneasy with the idea of Caesar gaining absolute power. Then, in 44 BCE, tragedy struck. Caesar was assassinated by a group of Roman senators stabbed to death on the Ides of March. His death sent shockwaves through Rome, plunging the city into chaos. For Cleopatra, Caesar's assassination was a devastating blow. Her strongest ally, the man who had restored her throne and fathered her son, was gone. Cleopatra now faced a dangerous and uncertain future. Rome was consumed by a power struggle and without Caesar's protection, her position in Rome became precarious. Realizing the danger, Cleopatra quickly returned to Egypt. She took Caesarion with her, ensuring that he would be raised in his homeland, far from Rome's political turmoil. Back in Alexandria, Cleopatra resumed her rule with renewed focus. She was now more aware than ever of the delicate balance she needed to maintain to keep Egypt safe. Caesar's death marked the end of an era for Cleopatra. With Rome divided, Cleopatra would soon face new alliances and new challenges, ones that would test her strength and shape the final years of her reign. Shortly after her return, Ptolemy XIV died. Rumors spread that Cleopatra may have ordered his death. Whether or not she was involved, Ptolemy's passing left Cleopatra as the sole ruler of Egypt. Now, with no co-ruler to challenge her authority, she took full command. Cleopatra was no longer simply a queen sharing the throne. She was the pharaoh of Egypt ruling independently over one of the ancient world's last great kingdoms. Cleopatra understood that Egypt's independence was fragile. The Roman Republic was expanding aggressively, claiming territories across the Mediterranean and beyond. Cleopatra saw the danger in this and knew that Egypt needed to be strong and self-sufficient to avoid falling under Rome's control. She envisioned a prosperous Egypt, one that could maintain its sovereignty in a world increasingly dominated by Roman power. To achieve this, Cleopatra continued the economic reforms she had begun earlier in her reign. Agriculture remained the foundation of Egypt's wealth, and Cleopatra took steps to ensure that the Nile's resources were managed wisely. Cleopatra also turned her attention to Egypt's domestic policies. She strengthened the financial systems, working closely with advisors to ensure that taxes were collected efficiently 
and that funds were used to benefit the people. Through careful economic management, Cleopatra secured a steady flow of resources that allowed Egypt to thrive independently without relying on foreign aid. She knew that financial stability would be crucial in maintaining Egypt's autonomy, especially as Rome continued to grow more powerful. In her court, Cleopatra surrounded herself with trusted advisors, men and women who shared her vision for Egypt's future. She was careful in her alliances, building relationships with local leaders and nobles who could help her maintain order and stability. By securing the loyalty of Egypt's powerful families, Cleopatra ensured that her rule would go unchallenged from within. She created a court that was loyal to her and to Egypt, united by a common goal of preserving the kingdom's independence. As Cleopatra solidified her position, Egypt grew stronger under her rule. Her careful balancing of economic reform, religious dedication, and political alliances created a foundation that would allow her kingdom to withstand the pressures of a changing world. But Cleopatra knew that Egypt's position remained delicate. Across the sea, Rome was still watching, and its leaders were preparing for the next phase of their expansion. Cleopatra had bought Egypt time, but she knew that sooner or later the balance would be tested. With Caesar gone, Rome was once again divided. Three powerful leaders emerged, forming an alliance known as the Second Triumvirate. This alliance included Octavian, Caesar's heir and adopted son, Lepidus, a seasoned general, and Mark Antony, a charismatic and ambitious military leader. Together, they sought to bring stability to Rome, but their alliance was fragile, held together by shifting loyalties and competition for power. Of the three, it was Mark Antony who held the most influence in the East, where Egypt lay waiting. Antony saw Egypt as a valuable asset, rich in resources and positioned at the heart of key trade routes. For Cleopatra, Antony represented more than just a Roman general. He was a powerful ally who could help her maintain Egypt's independence. Antony sent word, inviting Cleopatra to meet him in the city of Tarsus, in what is now Turkey. Cleopatra knew this meeting could change everything, and she prepared carefully. Cleopatra was no stranger to the power of presentation. She understood that to impress Antony, she needed to show him Egypt's wealth and majesty. When she arrived in Tarsus, she did so in a spectacle that would be remembered for centuries. Cleopatra sailed up the Cydnus River on a grand barge, with purple sails billowing in the wind and silver oars glinting in the sunlight. The air was filled with the scent of incense, and Cleopatra herself was dressed as the goddess Aphrodite, reclining on a golden couch under a canopy of silk. Musicians played, and her servants, dressed as mythical figures, attended her. Cleopatra presented herself not merely as a queen, but as a living goddess, a ruler worthy of Rome's respect. Antony was captivated, Cleopatra's display had worked perfectly, and the two met not as rivals, but as equals. Over the following days, Cleopatra and Antony spoke at length. She knew how to charm him, using her intelligence, wit, and understanding of Roman politics. Antony, impressed by her strength and ambition, began to see Cleopatra not only as a valuable ally, but as a partner. Their conversations quickly turned to the possibility of an alliance, one that would benefit both Egypt and Rome. For Cleopatra, this alliance with Antony was crucial. With Roman forces spread thin, she saw an opportunity to secure Egypt's position in the region. Antony, on the other hand, was drawn to Egypt's wealth. 
His campaigns had left him in need of resources, and Egypt, with its bountiful grain and treasures, was the key to funding his ambitions. Together, they formed a partnership that was both political and personal. Their bond grew stronger, and Antony soon returned to Egypt with Cleopatra, where they continued to deepen their alliance. In Egypt, Antony and Cleopatra's relationship flourished. They spent months together, sharing both the responsibilities of leadership and the pleasures of royal life. But this was more than a romance. It was a strategic union. Antony recognized Cleopatra's political skill and her deep knowledge of the region. Cleopatra, in turn, knew that Antony's influence in Rome could help protect Egypt from any threat. Together, they envisioned a future where their combined powers could rival even Rome itself. Their partnership soon bore fruit, literally. Cleopatra gave birth to their first child, Alexander Helios. His name, meaning son, was symbolic, representing light and power. A few years later, she bore a daughter, Cleopatra Selene, or Moon, and finally another son, Ptolemy Philadelphus. These children were more than symbols of their union. They represented the potential of an Eastern Empire, one that might stretch from Egypt across the Mediterranean. In 34 BCE, Antony made a public declaration that stunned the Roman world. Known as the Donations of Alexandria, Antony proclaimed that Cleopatra would rule as queen over Egypt, Cyprus, and parts of Syria. He recognized her children as rulers of other territories, giving Alexander Helios dominion over Armenia, Media, and Parthia, Cleopatra Selene over Libya, and Ptolemy Philadelphus over Phoenicia and Syria. Cleopatra was hailed as the Queen of Kings, and Caesarion, her son with Julius Caesar, was acknowledged as the legitimate heir of Rome. To Antony, these donations were a way of solidifying his alliance with Cleopatra and demonstrating his vision for a powerful Eastern Kingdom. For Cleopatra, it was a triumph. She had secured an empire for her children, positioning Egypt as a dominant force alongside Rome. Their union now represented not just a personal bond, but a political challenge to Rome's authority. They had become a royal family that symbolized the fusion of East and West with the power to reshape the future. Yet, while Cleopatra and Antony's alliance grew stronger, their actions did not go unnoticed in Rome. To many in Rome, this grand ceremony was an open challenge to Roman authority. Octavian, Antony's rival in the West, saw Antony's actions as a direct threat. The Roman Republic had long prided itself on its opposition to monarchy, and here was Antony, a Roman general, elevating a foreign queen and dividing territories as if he were an emperor. Octavian seized on this opportunity to sway the Roman people against Antony and Cleopatra. He launched a campaign of propaganda, painting Cleopatra as a dangerous seductress who had corrupted Antony. She was portrayed as a foreign queen who aimed to rule Rome itself through Antony, who, in Octavian's telling, had abandoned his Roman heritage. Octavian spread rumors suggesting that Antony intended to establish Cleopatra and Caesarion as rulers of Rome, undermining the Roman Republic. This fueled fears among the people of Rome, who saw Cleopatra's growing influence as a threat to their way of life. Tensions continued to rise. Rome was divided, with Octavian rallying supporters against Antony and Cleopatra. Antony, Isolated from Rome's political heart, focused on building his power in the east. But Octavian was preparing for war, determined to bring down Antony and Cleopatra and secure Rome under his sole control. The stage was set for a final confrontation. 
Cleopatra and Antony's dream of an Eastern Empire had sparked a fire that would soon consume them. Their vision was powerful, but Rome was stronger, and Octavian's ambition would not be denied. The battle for Egypt and for the future of both East and West was about to begin. In 32 BCE, Octavian made his move. He declared war, not against Antony, his fellow Roman, but against Cleopatra. By framing the conflict as a defense against a foreign queen, Octavian rallied the Roman people to his side. Rome prepared for battle, and the stage was set for one of the most famous naval confrontations in history, the Battle of Actium. In 31 BCE, the two sides met off the coast of Actium in western Greece. Antony and Cleopatra had assembled a vast fleet, determined to protect their alliance and defend their vision of an eastern empire. Cleopatra herself was on board, her ships lined with Egyptian soldiers and treasures, ready for war. But Octavian's forces were better trained and better supplied. He had the advantage of Rome's resources, and his fleet was commanded by Agrippa, a brilliant strategist. As the battle began, Antony and Cleopatra's forces found themselves outmaneuvered. Agrippa's tactics cut off Antony's supply lines, weakening his fleet. The fighting was intense, but Octavian's forces held the upper hand. In a desperate bid to save her fleet, Cleopatra's ships attempted to break through Octavian's line, but the strategy faltered. At a critical moment, Cleopatra's flagship turned and fled the battle, heading back toward Egypt. Seeing her retreat, Antony's forces wavered. Some accounts suggest that Antony followed her, abandoning his men in a moment of confusion. Whatever the reason, the fleet collapsed and Octavian emerged victorious. The Battle of Actium was a devastating blow. With their fleet destroyed and their forces scattered, Antony and Cleopatra's dreams of an Eastern Empire lay in ruins. The two returned to Alexandria, knowing that Octavian would soon follow. Back in Egypt, they prepared for a final stand. They fortified the city rallying what remained of their forces, but both knew the odds were against them. As Octavian's army advanced on Alexandria, Antony faced one defeat after another. His once powerful forces had dwindled, and his allies deserted him. Octavian's forces entered Egypt with little resistance, and Antony, realizing his position was hopeless, was overcome with despair. In a final act, Antony fell on his own sword, ending his life. His death marked the end of Rome's civil war, but for Cleopatra, the struggle was not over. After Antony's death, Cleopatra found herself isolated, facing the full force of Rome. Octavian had entered Alexandria, victorious and intent on claiming Egypt for the Roman Empire. Cleopatra was now confined within her palace, watching as her kingdom slipped away. Yet, even in this moment, she did not lose her determination. She hoped to negotiate with Octavian, seeking a way to secure a future for her children and perhaps some autonomy for Egypt. Cleopatra reached out to Octavian, offering Egypt's loyalty and its vast resources if he would allow her to retain a part of her kingdom. However, Octavian's ambitions for Egypt were clear. He did not intend to allow Cleopatra any rule. Instead, he planned to bring her to Rome, where she would be displayed in a grand procession, a symbol of Rome's victory over Egypt. Realizing what lay ahead, Cleopatra made a fateful decision. She had lived as a queen and did not want to face life as a captive. Cleopatra planned her own passing, choosing a dignified end that aligned with her life as a powerful ruler. Legend tells us that Cleopatra chose a snakebite, a method seen in her culture as a symbol of sovereignty. 
Some accounts say the snake was brought to her hidden in a basket, but what is clear is that Cleopatra took control over her final moments. She dressed in her royal garments, lying down with the grace of a queen, waiting for her fate. When Octavian's men entered her chambers, they found her already gone, her final act complete. With Cleopatra's passing, the Ptolemaic dynasty came to an end. Egypt, once a powerful and independent kingdom, was now a part of the Roman Empire. Octavian, who would soon become Rome's first emperor, took control of Egypt's wealth and resources, securing his power. The era of the pharaohs, stretching back thousands of years, had come to an end. As for Cleopatra's children, they faced an uncertain future. Caesarion, her son with Julius Caesar, was viewed by Octavian as a potential threat. He was captured and did not survive. Her other children, born to her and Antony, were taken to Rome, where they were raised in the household of Octavia, Octavian's sister. Their lives were forever changed, their family legacy a part of history. Cleopatra's story marked the end of ancient Egypt as a sovereign power, yet her legacy endured. She was Egypt's last pharaoh, a queen who made every effort to protect her kingdom, and her life became one of history's most enduring tales. And so, dear traveler, our trip to Egypt has come to a small little stop. Cleopatra's life may have ended, but her story lives on, echoing through the centuries as a powerful symbol of strength and resilience. Thank you for spending your night with me. May you find peace and comfort tonight, and may your tomorrow be filled with the strength to seize the day. Until next time, rest easy and dream heavenly. Good night.